Hello, Oldest Stories listeners. We are at a major historical turning point in our show, and also at the one-year anniversary of the first episode of the Oldest Stories podcast. I try to keep advertising and self-promotion to a minimum here, because I know you're here for the story, not for podcast navel-gazing. But I do want to take a moment to ask you for something. I tell this story for the sake of all the people listening, and the only thing I want in return is for more people to have a chance to be exposed to the history and the culture of the ancient Near East. I do what I can by producing the best show that I am able to each week, but I need your help to let more people know about the show and bring in more people into our little community. If you've enjoyed what you've heard up until now, it would be a great help if you could share this podcast around with friends and family. You can like our page on Facebook or click the little share links that show up in each episode in most podcast apps. You can leave a review on your podcast app or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, you can tell your friends in person the old-fashioned way about a show they might be interested in. I am glad to be able to share the tale of Mesopotamia with all of you. And to all y'all who've subscribed to the show through now, thank you for listening. These are The Oldest Stories, online at oldeststories.net. Babylon has fallen, and the light of civilization has been extinguished from southern Mesopotamia for the time being. But there remains one place where a line of continuity still runs, dating back to the early Sumerian and Akkadian periods. The city of Asher, once a Sumerian colony, then an Akkadian administrative center, then a thriving merchant empire, is going to fall on hard times during the period following the death of the great warlord Shamsi Adad. But even though much of these quiet years are very poorly documented, I want to continue the narrative thread of Asher, since we've already seen some pretty impressive things come out of there, and later on in our story, the city is going to ascend to some quite impressive heights. The story begins with the great conquests of Shamsi Adad, which were last discussed 15 episodes ago. If you want a detailed refresher on the history of Assyria, scroll down a bit until you see the episode Merchants and Families of Assyria for a discussion of the Merchant Kingdom and Daily Life in the North, and two episodes after that is the episode on Shamsi Adad and the Upper Mesopotamian Empire. But if you haven't got time to go back through the archives just now, let me start today with a little review of Assyria up until we last left it off in around 1750 BCE. Situated far to the north, along the Tigris River, the city of Asher has always been culturally and economically entwined with the southern Mesopotamians, adopting the Akkadian language and Akkadian cultural identity. By 2000 BCE, the city found itself independent following the collapse of the Sumerian Ur dynasty, and embarked on one of the most fascinating peaceful expansions of the Bronze Age. Instead of forming armies and conquering like their peers down in Sumer and Akkad were doing, the Assyrians formed the world's first joint stock companies and established mercantile colonies throughout the Middle East, most prominently in Anatolia. By 1800, they were fantastically wealthy, and this wealth made them a target. From somewhat humble beginnings, the warlord Shamsi Adad burst out from Babylon with an independent army of mercenaries, conquering Asher and the region around it, setting up the city of Ekelatum as his political capital. Soon enough, he came to rule all of what we would call northern Iraq and eastern Syria, an empire so large and unwieldy that he had to split the administration into three parts, the center under his own control, and Mari and Assyria as two subordinate kingdoms under the rule of his two sons. He gave control over the Assyrian region to his older son Ishmedagan, who ruled diligently and earnestly so long as his father was alive. As soon as his father died, though, Ishmedagan demonstrated that he simply didn't have what it took to keep the empire together in his father's absence. In less than four years, his empire was reduced to a rump state ruling Asher and a little bit of nearby territory from Ekelatum. 
Throughout Hammurabi's reign, Ishmi Dagid's position continues to worsen until finally reaching a nadir around 1763. In that year, the tiny neighboring Turakans, only barely known aside from this one incident, nearly overwhelmed the once great empire. Ishmi Dagan was able to secure peace talks by threatening to get his Babylonian allies involved, but during the talks, the Turakans used the opportunity to raid Ekeladam and Asher completely unopposed. By the time the inept Ishmedagan even realized that his kingdom had been overrun, they were already on the way out with most of the plunder of the countryside. Asher itself, which had once been the golden goose of the northern Tigris, was, from 1780s onward, running into financial difficulties of its own. In a way, their colonial empire became a victim of its own success, as 200 years of enriching Anatolia and establishing civilization and firm trade routes among the warring tribes and states had allowed the petty chiefs to begin to develop properly into territorial kings, and the top priority of these newly emerging states was, of course, the conquest of their neighbors. Nobody appears to have been directly hostile to the Assyrian merchants as a class, but new hazards arose for them anyway. Tariffs and tolls were established in more and more places. Merchants passing through a city heading to a rival city might find their wares confiscated outright. And the hazards of increased warfare brought about a rise in banditry and looting by informal raider groups and greedy soldiers alike. The Assyrian merchants had always responded to localized warfare with a temporary suspension of trade until the local issues were sorted out. But this widespread increase in conflict began to cut into the merchants' bottom line, and colony after colony began to fold. By 1720, Karim Kanesh, the flagship colony, closed its doors for the last time, and by the end of the century, the great merchant empire of Asher was no more. During this economic and political decline, the city of Asher was in an odd place. They had never really wanted to be part of Shamsi Adad's empire, but during the good times, they seemed quite content to be part of the upswing, though surely the large degree of autonomy the warlord allowed Asher must have helped that along. But as they became part of a failing rump state with their pocketbooks hurting, more and more they must have asked themselves why they allowed themselves to be ruled by a king from Ecolatum. Asher had always been a bit of an oddity among Akkadian city-states. Everyone had a king, and everyone had a town council. But while normally the king drove events and the council was a nearly invisible historical footnote, in Asher the situation had been reversed until the coming of the Amorite warlords. What happens next in Assyrian history is almost completely unknown. We basically have a pair of king's lists which don't agree with each other, and tiny bits of fragments here and there. From what little we do have, it is tempting to paint a very interesting picture of a city undergoing an identity crisis. And despite the scanty evidence we have today, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I will discuss a bit involving dates, but it's hard to date anything at all here, and even the order of large chunks of the events that I'm going to tell you now are a matter of dispute among the academic community. This is what I think the best and the most interesting interpretation of events is, but our understanding is almost certain to change as more evidence and more details come to light over the next few decades. The last firm date I can give you for the next few hundred years is going to be 1761, the year Hammurabi completed his northern conquests. Already there is dispute here, with some thinking that Naram Sin dies or is deposed by Hammurabi in favor of direct rule from Babylon. My own suspicion, as mentioned during the relevant episodes in my Hammurabi series, is that most of the north was ruled by vassal kings, and that Naram Sin remained one of these for the rest of his life. Things proceeded at a low pace for a while, with Naram Sin possibly dying in about 1740 after 40 years on the throne. 
Of course, some will give you shorter estimates for his reign, as short as 11 years, but either way, it seems he was succeeded by his son, Mut Ashkur. Of Mut Ashkur, all we can say for sure is that he was Ishmi Dagon's son, and he married a Hurrian wife from the Turrican clan who had given his father such an embarrassing defeat. Perhaps ten years later, Mut Ashkur was succeeded by his own son, Ramush, named for the only somewhat famous Akkadian king of whom we know even less. Honestly, it's entirely possible, depending on how you put the timelines together, that neither of these two actually ruled in Asher, and their inclusion in one of the king's lists could well be an error or misinterpretation on the part of the later chronicler. The issue circles around two key dates, 1740 and 1706. If you remember from the episode The New Order, the years just prior to 1740 saw a massive general revolt against Samsu Ilana, the son of Hammurabi, that saw for a brief window nearly the entire Babylonian Empire outside of the Babylonian heartland in revolt. Though he was, over the rest of his reign, able to restore nearly the entire borders of Hammurabi's old empire, the two big exceptions to this were Sumer and the very north reaches of the Tigris River. It isn't clear whether or not Assyria was part of this massive rebellion, or if they simply fell out of the Babylonian sphere as a result of it. Ishmi Dagon and his entire line whichever of them happened to be king in this particular year, were completely dependent on Babylonian support for their legitimacy at this point. It seems odd that they would throw that away, but of course, they may well have had reasons that are simply lost to us. Whatever the case, when Ecolatum separated from Babylon, Asher started to wonder if they could finally break free of Ecolatum. While Ishmi Dagon had been alive, his long governorship under his father and then years of kingship had allowed him to enmesh himself politically in the life of Asher, and it may well be that his first two descendants managed the same feat, but somewhere between 1740 and 1706, things came to a head. It was the time of the short-lived King Asinum, a man who lives as nothing but a name, with only four brief years ascribed to his reign. He's said to be the grandson of Shamsi Adad, so he could well have been the governor of Asher under one of the kings of Ecolatum, or he could have been the king in between any of the other kings, or he could have followed Ramush. All we really know is one inscription from a king who doesn't even appear in any of our king's lists, a fellow named Puzzer Sin. Puzzer Sin is in an interesting place, completely invisible in the later tradition, and yet literally the only person for the next hundred years with solid archaeological proof that he actually exists, in the form of an inscription. Puzzer Sin's inscription reads... When Puzzer Sin, vice regent of the god Asher, son of Asher Bel Shameh, destroyed the evil of Asinum, offspring of Shamsi Adad, who was overlord of the city of Asher and instituted proper rule for the city of Asher. At that time, I, Puzzer Sin, removed from the throne a foreign plague, not of the flesh of the city of Asher. The god Asher justly rules with pure hands, and I, by the command of Asher himself, my lord, destroyed the improper thing which he had worked on. The wall and palace of Shamsi Adad, his grandfather, who was a foreign plague, not of the flesh of the city of Asher, and who had destroyed the shrines of the city of Asher, I destroyed that palace which he had worked on. I built a wall from the facade of the gate of the deity Ilula to the residence, a structure which no other king had built before. Now, there's a lot going on in this one inscription. Right from the start, we see Puzzer Sin acting as a traditional Assyrian monarch, adopting the older title, Vice Regent of Asher, rather than the more common Amorite title of king. Vice-regent is a humble and pious title, recalling the days when Asher was ruled mostly by a council of prominent native citizens and the god Asher held as king. 
He positions himself directly against the foreign elements that were descended from the warlord Shamsi Adad, contrasting the foreign plague with proper rule, as if the two aren't necessarily opposed to each other. It seems that the Amorite rulers had destroyed native temples, which could well have been the factor that incited Puzzer Sin's revolt, and had done other unspecified improper things. The actual inscription isn't super clear, but when he speaks of the palace, remember that the nearby city of Echolatum's name literally meant palace. So while it's speculated that Asher may have had a degree of independence before this time, here is when they finally went up to their overlords, tore down the Amorite palace, and used the materials to build a new, more pious structure for the native gods of the city. We don't know what came of old Puzzer's sin. He may have ruled only briefly, because even his own city forgot about him in later times. Still, though the destruction of the Amorite palace may well have been quite cathartic for the Assyrian rebels, it didn't change the political reality they found themselves in. They were a group of Akkadian Assyrians who had just been formally ruled by Amorites for a century, and those ruling Amorites had in turn been dominated within the region by nearby Hurrian communities. Puzzer Sin and the thrill of victory may have united the city for a time, but whether he died from foul play, accident, or natural causes, his death leaves a power vacuum and some big questions about the very soul of the city of Asher. The year is 1706, maybe, and whether you like the story I just presented or one of many alternate speculations, the city of Asher is now free of foreign rule and without clear leadership. The question stands, would Asher be an Amorite city, a Hurrian city, or an Assyrian one? Each group had a political and economic stake in the game, and offered advantages and disadvantages in the chaotic mess of North Tigris politics. Among the native Assyrians, there were even more questions about what their city would look like in the years going forward. Would the council regain its former influence, or would they follow the far more common pattern of dominant kingship? Fueling the fire were a whole host of merchant families who had spent generations accumulating wealth, but who, with the death of the Karams and broad decline in region-wide economic activity, may have decided to move from making money through exchange and instead focus on protecting the wealth they did have, should the situation get any worse. The spark is lit by a man named Asher Duggle, but over the next six years, seven men described in later records as the Sons of Nobody split the city into warring factions. How much of this was explicitly ideological, and how much was just power players seeking power for their own factions, is impossible to tell. We know literally nothing about any of these men. The king's list would suggest that they each took the crown in order, though given that it's claimed to be something of a little civil war, it seems more likely that these men all claimed kingship at some point and may have overlapped for parts of it. The winner emerging from all this was a man named Adesi. Now here's one to remember. He was a native Assyrian, and though we know little about him personally, his victory would begin one of the longest dynasties in history. The Adassid dynasty will continue to rule Assyria for the next 955 years, until 745 BCE. In him, the city of Asher decisively removed the last foreign influences, or at least the last traces of Hurrian and Amorite domination over the city. At the same time, the city would decisively shift power from council to king for the rest of its history, though the rulers would for quite some time continue calling themselves vice-regent of Asher, saving the title of king for the god alone. We'll usually keep calling them kings just for simplicity's sake. Adesi may have ruled for one year, or he may have ruled for twenty. But it's typically his son, Bel Bani, who is more properly regarded as the founder of the dynasty by Assyrians themselves. Despite the high esteem he would come to be held in, being elevated to semi-divine mythical founder, no more is known of him concretely than his father. 
He probably ruled for eight years and solidified the gains his father had made, providing much needed stability for the fractured city. The next 13 kings are nothing more than names on a list, and not all of them are definitively Akkadian, Assyrian, as opposed to Amorite or Hurrian, suggesting to some that the period of foreign domination had not ended as conclusively as the Assyrians would have liked. Don't think you have to remember any of these names, but to go through the list real quick. Belbani is followed by Libaya, followed by Sharma Adad, then Iptar Sin, then Baziah and Lulaya, this last being remembered as not actually part of the dynasty. Lulaya could have been a usurper, or he could have been a trusted advisor acting as a regent while the next king came of age. There's literally no way to know. Shuninua followed Libaya, then Sharma Adad II, and Erisham III. Erisham, as best we can figure from the dating, would have been the king during the final fall of Babylon, with his father ruling through most of the chaos immediately preceding it. Though we can say nothing about any of these rulers specifically, it seems likely that their reigns were decently quiet. Asher would have been a well-fortified city from the days when it had been wealthy, and it would also have been fairly poor. These two factors, along with Babylon's presence generally stabilizing the immediate region, likely helped keep them safe through most of the Babylonian Golden Age. A big question mark here is their relationship with the Kassites, but it's likely that being a single fortified city with a lack of big open fields and a bit more rocky terrain, they were a less suitable target for the earliest horse nomads. The merchants of Assyria were not the great power they had once been, but we still know of occasional deals with their southern neighbors, and as the period came to a close, at least a bit of wealth seems to have circulated once again, like silver lifeblood, through the city. After Erisham and the collapse of Babylon, we get an interesting little triplet. Shamsiadad II, Ishmedagan II, and Shamsiadad III. These were almost certainly native Assyrians of the line of Adasi, but taking the name of the great warlord to project aggressive confidence in the newly unsettled anarchy of the 1500s BC. Over a hundred years removed now from the foreign occupation, it seems that the stock of the old Amorite kings had risen a fair bit by the time of the crisis. This may well have been the time in which Puzzer Sin was quietly forgotten about, and the city must surely have seen its militia called up more than once in the unknown wars of this dark age. The slowly emerging return to prosperity may well have been enhanced by a series of successful wars, since after these three kings we see Asher Nirari, another complete unknown, and then in 1503 BCE, nearly a hundred years after the fall of Babylon, the city of Asher is finally prosperous enough that we get the very first signs of recovery visible in the archaeological record coupled with our first surviving mention of any Assyrian king in over 200 years, Puzzer Asher III. With any other king, we would gloss over mere building projects, but for this Puzzer Asher, the building projects are significant because they are the first measurable progress we've seen in Asher in a long time. He restored a temple of Sin Shamash, the sun and moon gods, a temple of Anu Adad, the sky and storm gods, and the house of the city's patron god Asher himself. He constructed a whole new wall for the city, enclosing a much greater area that would come to be known as the new city. How had he gained the wealth to build all this all of a sudden? How had Asher expanded so much to have outpaced its ancient walls? There is no way of knowing this is a dark age for a reason, but we do know that Puzzer Asher was making treaties with the new Kassite kings of Babylon, demarcating their mutual border midway up the Tigris River. Maybe the Shamsiadads followed their namesake's example and survived the dark century of chaos by conquering before they were conquered. Maybe Puzzer Asher III is a great but forgotten general of history. 
All we can say for sure is that by perhaps 1503, Asher, which had been so close to the brink of obscurity for the rest of time, was reborn like a phoenix rising again on the world stage. We even have evidence from Egyptian archives of Puzzer Asher sending tribute to the Pharaoh Tutmos III. This was overtly an act of submission, possibly inspired by the Pharaoh's recent historic journey to the Euphrates River, a landmark in Egyptian history, but implicitly it demonstrated that Asher was a city with enough wealth to not only pull together a care package of lapis lazuli, finely carved stone vessels, imported woods and horses, but it also had the means to transport them to the other side of the world, in Egypt, a place that had only just become become directly accessible from Mesopotamia. But even in this care package, we can see how precarious Asher's situation still is. Tutmos, on his return journey from the Euphrates, had fought a battle with the new rising power of Upper Mesopotamia, the warlords of the Mitanni. Puzzer Asher may have been hoping to secure the pharaoh's assistance against this new threat, the Hurrian kingdom that had come down from the mountains and must have seemed unstoppable, even to the newly revitalized Assyrians. What sort of battles did Puzzer Asher win against the Mitanni to keep his little kingdom safe, and what sort of diplomacy was required? For all that we would like to speculate, these things may never be known. But at the end of the day, Puzzer Asher was able to pass on a prosperous and independent city-state to his son Enlil Nasir, who would proceed to do nothing at all, which survives to this day, though by some estimates it was he and not his father who sent the diplomatic envoys to Egypt. Enlil Nasir would then give birth to a son, Nur-Ili, who would also be a completely silent king in our history. After Nur-Ili dies, sometime around 1454 BCE, he leaves the throne to his son, Asher Shiduni. We know nothing about the circumstances surrounding this, except that Asher Shiduni was murdered by his uncle, Asher Rabi, after only a month on the throne. Perhaps Asher Shiduni was too young, perhaps Asher Rabi was too ambitious, and perhaps we're seeing the emergence of a new factionalism within Assyrian politics. The independent streak of the Assyrian citizenry was flaring up under the threat of the Hurrian Mitanni, and Asher Shiduni may not have been as determined to preserve the city's independence as they would have liked. Our story today ends with Asher Rabi's son, who proved to be the same sort of weakling his cousin had been. Under Asher Nadin Ahe the I, in around 1430 BCE, Asher becomes a vassal state of the Mitanni. Now, as we will see, this is not the end of the world for Asher. The Mitanni are particularly notable for their lack of centralization, and though their Hurrian overlords are a cause for resentment, the city will still manage to do quite well for itself in the next hundred years of foreign domination. But we have gotten way far ahead in our story, well into the Late Bronze Age, and it is well past time that we head back and start introducing our new players for the next historical period. I've already made mention of all three of the empires that will come to dominate the Late Bronze Age. The Hittites, the Kassites, and the Mitanni, as well as Egypt in its expansionist New Kingdom phase. But I have hardly explained any of them. Of Egypt, I will be doing no explaining. A Kiwi named Dominic Perry runs the Fantastic History of Egypt podcast, which I highly recommend for anyone interested in that side of the world. For the other three, the Hittites, Kassites, and Mitanni, they're all in their own way related. Not directly, but each is a nomadic elite that comes out of the mountains during this period to take over settled lands and rule over them as a military aristocracy. We'll be looking in detail about each in turn, but for the next few episodes, we're going to be traveling west into a region that we haven't seen much of at all until now. And so next week, I'll be introducing you to Anatolia, 
the peninsula that holds modern-day Turkey, what sort of people live there, and what the Great Stage looks like as the very first Hittites arrive to carve out what will be a proper little empire. So join us next time as we meet all new peoples, see all new ways of life, and then consign them all to the dustbin of history as they get conquered by new arrivals. Thank you for listening.